On March 29, 2024, an experienced climber stood on a cornice of Mount St. Helens in Washington State, attempting to video and take pictures of his ascent to post on social media. Having successfully conquered the peak nearly 30 times, he was no stranger to its treacherous slopes, but while standing on the crater's rim, he would feel every climber's worst nightmare, the snow under his boots moving. What would happen next is nearly unbelievable. This is his story. Before we jump into the video, I want to thank all my loyal viewers and subscribers. You mean the world to me, and for those new here, please consider dropping a sub, as the 2024 climbing season is just getting underway. Hopefully, we don't have very many of these videos to report, but nevertheless, your support is appreciated. Mount St. Helens is a towering volcano located in Skamania County, Washington, USA. It's part of the Pacific Northwest, a region known for its stunning landscapes and natural wonders. Geographically, Mount St. Helens is not far from major cities like Portland, Oregon, about 52 miles southwest, and Seattle, Washington, roughly 98 miles to the north. This volcano is nestled within the Cascade Range, a chain of mountains that forms part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, stretching from California to Canada. Mount St. Helens is one of several volcanoes in this range. Today, the mountain stands at 8,363 feet tall, making it a popular place for mountaineers and outdoorsmen. But the volcano has a dark history. Mount St. Helens, a Washington state volcano, has been dormant for over a century, but today it erupted with smoke and ash after a week of earthquakes which rattled the area. The volcano oozed lava and belched an explosion that was heard up to 45 miles away. The blast took place about 1 o'clock this afternoon. It was the first volcanic eruption in this country since... In the spring of 1980, Mount St. Helens began to show signs of unrest. On March 27th, volcanic explosions and pyroclastic flows marked the start of a turbulent period. Over the next two months, a series of earthquakes and steam venting episodes rocked the mountain, signaling the injection of magma beneath its surface. This activity caused a large bulge to form on the north slope, and created a fracture system. Then on May 18, 1980, at 8.32 a.m., a magnitude 5.1 earthquake shook the mountain, triggering a massive landslide on its north face, the largest sub-aerial landslide ever recorded. An aerial observer saw the north side of the mountain looking all rippled and churning just before it started to slide northwards from the summit. As the avalanche came down, it split into three parts. The surrounding lakes would rise as the avalanche plowed out into the water, along with other areas being affected from the amount of debris and trees flooding the valleys below. The biggest part of the avalanche went westward down the north fork of the Toodle River Valley. It moved fast, covering about 15 miles in just 10 minutes. When it settled, it spread out over the valley floor, about 150 feet deep on average but in some spots, it piled up to more than 500 feet deep. The mess it left behind covers around 24 square miles. It's a mix of different stuff from the volcano, like big blocks, pebbles, sand, and even chunks of glacial ice all jumbled together. When the north flank of the volcano suddenly gave way, it let out a huge burst of pressure from inside. It's like when you open a shaken soda bottle or poke a hole in something under lots of pressure like a boiler tank. This blast shot out to the north, smashing everything in its path. It covered 150 square miles, causing havoc in its wake. Trees were ripped off hills within six miles of the volcano, and pretty much all plants were flattened for up to 13 miles in a half circle north of the mountain. The blast left layers of rocks, bits of plants, and other stuff over the area, some piles more than three feet thick. By late afternoon on May 18th, the eruption started to calm down, and by early May 19th, it had completely stopped. During the nine hours when the volcano eruption was at its height, about 540 million tons of ash fell over an area of more than 22,000 square miles. For context, that is greater than the size of Croatia. But compared to all the stuff that slid off the volcano during the avalanche, it's only about 10% of that amount. The ecological impact was devastating. 
with thousands of animals killed and trees covering over 200 square miles blown down by the force of the eruption. In response, Governor Dixie Lee Ray declared a state of emergency. However, she controversially believed that people should use their judgment and stay away from the mountain, sparking debate over government intervention in disaster situations. The eruption of Mount St. Helens remains the deadliest and most economically destructive volcano event in U.S. history with approximately 57 deaths and $1.1 billion in property damage. Governor Ray's approach faced criticism, but she defended her actions, emphasizing the acceptance of risk in daily life. The disaster also prompted significant changes in disaster preparation and government response in the region. In September of 2004, the volcano returned to life after 18 years of silence. The slow-moving, dome-building eruption extruded a dump truck of lava into the crater per second and continued for three and a half years. Roscoe Rocky Shorey, a daring mountaineer hailed from the scenic town of Washougal, Washington, nestled in the Pacific Northwest. He was originally from Hawaii, where his Filipino immigrant mother would teach him the value of perseverance. Rocky, along with his sister and parents, would move to Vancouver, Washington in 1988. Rocky's parents had spent their early lives in extreme poverty, before moving to Hawaii to give their children a better life. Since his youth, Shori possessed an unquenchable thirst for adventure, drawn to the rugged beauty of the Cascade Range. While he always had a fascination for the outdoors, he also had an active social media account where he consistently posted videos and pictures of his expeditions. Rocky lost his mother as a teen, and it shaped him. He felt as if he could never waste a second, especially when it came to exploring the outdoors. In 2023, one week, he spent time whitewater rafting on the Arkansas River and was in a helicopter touring the Swiss Alps the next. In October, he was scuba diving with manta rays in Hawaii. In November, he was rock climbing at Smith Rock Park. Finally, in December, he trekked through the Himalayas. His connection with Mount St. Helens ran deep, having summited the volcano an impressive 27 times. His last successful summit of the mountain was on March 14th, when he posted this photo and video of him snowboarding down the slope. Beyond St. Helens, Rocky went on perilous expeditions across the globe. As a seasoned guide, he had led others through daunting alpine challenges, fascinating them with tales of his epic adventures. Another frequent expedition was to Mount Hood, where he displayed his remarkable skills and resilience by conquering the formidable peak over 40 times. On March 29, 2024, Rocky Shorey would plan to once again complete a climb of Mount St. Helens, then snowboard down the steep slopes, documenting his entire expedition. What he didn't realize is this time, his climb would be different than any of the other 27 trips on the mountain. The day started like all the others. There really wasn't any excitement. The mountain is usually climbed in one day and typically takes anywhere from 7 to 12 hours, depending on the route. Since Rocky had completed the climb so often, he didn't face anything that he wasn't expecting, and after a few hours, he stood near the summit. Rocky would remove his backpack and other gear, setting it beside him while he pulled out his camera and began taking pictures and a video about 20 feet from the edge of the crater. Without warning, an enormous cornice, a menacing overhang of snow, broke loose and plummeted into the crater below. Cornices range from small wind lips of snow to overhangs of hard snow larger than a school bus. They can break off the terrain suddenly and unexpectedly and can sometimes be triggered from a distance. Overhung cornices can pull back further than expected onto a flat ridge top and catch people by surprise. The force of the falling snow knocked Rocky off his feet, sending him tumbling down the mountainside. He dug his fingers into the edge of the cornice in a desperate attempt to stop his fall, but he couldn't hold on, leaving deep gouges in the snow as he slid off the edge and plummeted about 1,200 feet, landing in an avalanche triggered by the piece of the cornice that had fallen from under him at the top. The mass of snow carried him deeper into the crater. As the snow settled around him, he had no doubt that he was lucky to be alive, but the 42-year-old was alone in the unforgiving wilderness inside the crater of Mount St. Helens. Rocky faced a desperate struggle for survival. Clad only in snowboard boots, synthetic pants, and a lightweight shirt, he fought against the elements. With sheer determination, he clawed his way out of the snow, determined to defy the odds. His goal 
was to climb the icy, near-vertical interior wall of the crater and reach the safety of the rim above. Rocky would zigzag his way up the nearly vertical face, and he almost nearly reached the top. Twenty feet away from the top of the crater, a snow overhang prevented Rocky from climbing any further. Eventually, he would give up his current plan, descending back down the nearly vertical wall before walking east and trying a similar method on a different part of the wall. He would be digging his hands into the snow as he climbed, but it was no use. His snowboard boots offered little traction, and he could not successfully climb. On yet another attempt to climb over the rim, Rocky would slip and fall again. This time, he would not get up. Rescuers would eventually see three areas where his body had hit the snow during his second fall. The first inkling that something could be wrong came late that evening when Rocky failed to respond to messages from his closest and oldest friends. His absence was noticed by fellow climbers, who discovered personal items including a backpack and digital recording devices near the crater's rim at 7am the following day. It became evident that a snow cornice had broken off, leading to Rocky's tragic fall. The climbers would peer into the crater where they would see a body lying motionless about 1,200 feet below, along with evidence of a struggle to climb the wall inside. They would then descend the peak to make a call to rescue services. But on the trip down, they came across a climber who instantly recognized Rocky's gear, as she was a close friend of his. A search and rescue team was swiftly airlifted into the crater, where the pilot took the helicopter back and forth, close to the edge of the approximately one mile wide crater, until the crew spotted what looked like a body in the snow. They touched down in the dome inside the crater. Because of the volcanic activity in the crater, people aren't allowed to go in except for special circumstances, such as during professional rescues. The environment there is constantly changing. Steam vents open up unexpectedly, and the ground shifts daily. Eventually, after securing Rocky's body, he would be airlifted out of the crater. One of the rescuers would state he gave it everything he could to survive. We were all thinking, like, who is this guy? Who is this person? He almost made it to the top. Rocky's death would shock the mountaineering community, and tributes have been pouring out on his Facebook page, with friends posting pictures of themselves eating his favorite treat, a Dairy Queen blizzard. Some friends have struggled to grasp that a man as experienced as Rocky died on Mount St. Helens, generally considered a relatively safe and easy climb compared to most other peaks in the Pacific Northwest. I don't think there is a better way to end Rocky's story than a quote from his close friend. He lived life with a zest and vibrancy that most of us will never understand, and in his 42 years of short life, he definitely lived well over a hundred years worth of life.